Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. If you are enjoying this podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. Well, it is our 4,150th episode special, and today I'm bringing you an episode of Suspense. The original air date is May the 22nd, 1956, and the title is Fragile Contents Death. And now... Tonight's presentation of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Tonight, we bring you a story of a postmaster and his desperate search for an unwelcome package. We call it Fragile Contents Death. So now, starring Victor Perrin, here is tonight's suspense play, Fragile Contents Death. All it took was a phone call. Until it came that morning, everything at the post office was the same as it had always been. I was just another postmaster, 40 years old, with the postal problems of some 80,000 people to look after. All it took was that call to make things a nightmare. As I said, the day was just a day. I remember I was making up my mind to get busy on the stuff piled on my desk. It was 9.15. Hmm... Morning, Mr. Jordan. Oh, morning, Hartley. I'm just going to send for you. Don't tell me all this this heap is for me. That's right. Well, didn't anybody weed it out? It's been weeded, Mr. Jordan. Well, if I must, I must. Even a parcel, I see. Yeah, yeah, it's marked personal. From Paxton and Brown, something or other, Broadway, New York. Oh, I remember. Sure, this must be that new type of lawn sprinkler I ordered for the wife. I should have had it sent to the house. Put it over there, would you? I'll take it along when I go home. Here? That's fine. Post office, this is Jordan. Jordan. That postmaster, Jordan? That's right. What can I do for you? Plenty. You got a bomb someplace in the mail down there. Is this a joke? Listen carefully. This is no joke. A guy I know sent another guy a bomb, a time bomb. It'll be delivered here in town. It was supposed to be set to go off at 7 tonight, but it ain't. He forgot to change the timer before he shipped it. It's set for 2.30 this afternoon, five hours from now. I don't like that. Maybe some poor guy like a mailman will get it instead of the guy who's supposed to. That's why I'm telling you about it. You gotta find it and stop it. One other thing, too. It's fixed so it'll go off when you open the package got all that? Sure, I I got it. But how do I recognize this bomb? Who's it addressed to? I ain't telling who sent it. I don't care about who sent it. Who gets it? Who gets the bomb? Hello? Hello? Hartley. Yes, sir? You probably heard enough of that to know what's going on. Something about about a bomb in the mail. Yeah. Now listen carefully. I'm only going to tell you once. Get out of here on the double. I want the assistant superintendent of mails and the dispatcher, Stuart and Fox. Get them in here as quick as you can. You got that? Yes, sir. Operator. Uh, This is Jordan. How many inspectors are in today? Do you know? Just a moment, Mr. Jordan. Mr. Williams is in. Mr. Jackson left word he'll be out in Lincoln County until tomorrow... And Mr. Thompson entered the hospital this morning to have his appendix out. Well, ring Ed Williams for me, please. Tell him to get over to my office right away. It's urgent. Yes, sir. Oh, Fox. Come in, sit down. Yes, sir. Something wrong? Plenty. Bomb in the mail. 
You know much about it? I'll tell you later. Williams and Stewart are in on this, too. Man, are we ever in for a busy day. Hartley said there was a hurry-up call in here, so I... close that door in my face, Joe. Come on in, Ed. Close the door. Sit down, both of you. Now sit down and listen. Uh Uh-oh. No raises this year. I've been waiting for him to spring it on us. Button it up, Joe. Here's what we do have staring us in the face. I just told Fox a minute ago there's a bomb in the mail someplace. Oh, bomb? That's right. A few minutes ago, I got a phone call. I don't know who it was. All I got were these facts. It's now 9.30. Between now and 2.30, we've got to find a time bomb which was mailed to somebody here in town. Somebody? Don't, don't have any name at all? He didn't get around to that. Either he wouldn't tell me or he was cut off. I'm hoping... Just a slender hope, I know. I'm hoping he'll call back, but we can't count on it. Oh, how do we know this isn't a leg pull, Doug? We don't. But we can't afford to take chances with somebody's life. Would you? No. What kind of a package? We don't know. Any kind. Oh, it's great. That spreads your field out something terrific, Stuart. How? Well, you not only have your truck packages, you have carrier packages, too. Carrier wouldn't have that big a package. Stu, with the powerful explosives we have nowadays and the small wiring circuits possible, why not? Yeah, I'll give you another one. How about a newspaper roll? That's big enough, isn't it? Carriers handle them, don't they? That's right. Now, here's what I think. If that thing was mailed early this morning, it's either out there in the parcel post bin or at one of the substations. If it was mailed last night, it's probably on one of the trucks right now. Or else it's been delivered. Or... Else it's been delivered, yes. A lot of stuff's off the trucks by now. That complicates it, but let's do what we can as fast as we can. Fox, you round up all of the special delivery cars, send them out after those trucks, and get all the packages back here. We'll go over them after they get here. Okay. Try to get the drivers to remember what's been delivered and where. Skip the insurance deliveries. This won't be insured. Get as much back as you can. But what if they can't remember everything? You leave that to me. But do this, too. Call the substations. Get all their stuff in here. All right. Anything else? Not now. All right. I'm on my way. Stuart, you'll go through our own stuff in the back. Let's see. Delivery from New York Central's number three hasn't come over from the station yet, has it? No. Well, that makes it a little better. Get everything we've got together in one place and keep it there. Keep the out-of-town packages out of it. Just add the stuff from the substations and the trucks as it comes in. And the pickup trucks, of course. What? Some of the drop boxes out in the suburbs are for letters and parcels both. We'd get some packages coming in on the pickups from those boxes. I'd forgotten that. The trucks should be in by 11. We might as well go ahead with everything else until I get here. Just so we get them as soon as they come in. I'll leave that to you. If we're going to do all this, I'd better get on it. No use standing around here any longer than necessary. No, no, go ahead. You want me to check the packages, right? I don't have to tell you your business, Ed. I know your record as an inspector is A-1. Well, fill me in a little more, will you, Doug? Okay, shoot. Is this a time bomb? That's what he said. We have less than five hours now. Yeah, I got that. Well, what else about it? Would it be safe to open? No, no. It'll go off if you open it. He said so. Oh, rougher and rougher. I'm going to get help, Doug. All you want. Use your phone. Help yourself. Thanks. Operator. Outside line. Thank you. State Police, Company A, Sergeant Rock speaking. Uh, Rocky, this is Ed Williams, post office. Is Jesse in today? Yeah, you want him? No, don't call him, no time. Tell him to come on over here right away, would you? Sure. What do you want with explosive experts? You got a bomb? Uh, maybe. Keep it under your hat. You know me. Another thing, Rocky, you guys got the fluoroscope just now? No, oh, a touchy one, huh? No, we loaned it to Company E up in Fallman. I could use it, that's for sure. It's only about 100 miles. I'll call them up and get them to fly it in. Probably get it to, you know, about an hour or a little over. Oh, good. And you'll tell Jesse, huh? Yeah, we'll do. Now, to work, Doug. Same here, boy. Yeah, how about those carriers? About a hundred of them, aren't there? Ninety-four. Well, can you do it? Can you hit them all? I don't know. All I can do is try. Bet you're thinking the same thing I am. Remembering the same case. Bowling Green, Kentucky. Yeah. That poor devil of a carrier. 
Alive, but barely. That's one reason I want to find this bomb before our luck runs out. Well, we're going to see to that. That it doesn't run out. I hope you're right, Ed. I sure hope you're right. You are listening to Fragile Contents Death. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. For you, the choice between living an ethical life or that of a fugitive from the law may be an easy one to make. But for the young parolee in tomorrow night's drama on the FBI in Peace and War, the choice is more difficult. His old criminal friends want to involve him in an easy money scheme. When he comes to the turning point, that moment at which he must decide between staying straight or going back to a life of crime, the temptation is most intense. For drama that packs a human interest punch, don't miss the turning point. Tomorrow night, when the FBI in Peace and War is on the air over most of these same stations. And now we bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Victor Perrin, starring in tonight's production, Fragile Contents Death, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. They were all on it now. Williams, Fox, Stewart, and all the others we could trust to keep a cool head. The lid was on every place possible. To the average man buying his three-cent stamp, it was business as usual. We didn't even let the majority of the help know it. But off in one of our fairly isolated corners, a pile of packages was growing. I looked at the clock. 10.20. Just about an hour gone. Four hours left. Oh, Stu... How are things going? Who knows? Well, as can be expected in a thing like this, I suppose. Better wipe off that sweat before somebody tumbles that the day isn't that hot. Thanks. Sit down. Huh. Are any of them wise yet? Oh, don't think so. They'll probably get out. Things have a way. Yeah, that they do. How are you standing it yourself? Well, I... You worried? Not very happy. None of us are. I keep thinking, what if I get hold of the thing... When... Ever been in an explosion? No. You weren't in the service now. Ever see an explosion? Been close to one? Yeah, I... Well, I came by once just after a gasoline truck tangled with a pole and took off. It was a pretty bad sight. I see. Would... Would you like to take the day off? Oh, I wouldn't think of it. Nobody'd blame you. I wouldn't, I promise you. I can't do that, Doug. What if I did and the thing got by and I could have prevented it? I'm nervous, maybe. I don't like the setup, maybe. But I'm not chicken. I'm staying with it. I figured you would, Joe. And they say every soldier figures the next bullet isn't going to get him. That's the way I'm figuring myself on this deal. Good idea. The only thing we have to worry about, Joe, where is this one aimed? Eleven thirty. Two hours gone. I went back to the mailroom. Hello, Doug. How's it going? Well, we have all this over here so far. A lot of work. Uh-huh. Any leads, Ed? Not yet, not even anything suspicious. Well, how can you tell? I can't tell, really. Sometimes there's something about the handwriting or the printing of the... I guess you just feel it sometimes. I don't know. I don't get anything like that in this stuff. Not even a fake return address? Not a one in the lot. None of the locals, anyway. We've checked them all. Fluoroscope in yet? Well, the plane's in. They phoned me a few minutes ago. It's on the way over. Be here any minute. Swell. Mr. Jordan, telephone. Okay, what line? On eight. Thank you, I'll get it. This is Jordan. Uh, Mr. Jordan, this is Malloy in truck 15. 
Yes, Malloy? I got the word about getting back these packages. Everything's practically okay. Only this. My second delivery, I left one off at this place, 1724 Lime Street. I go back there a while ago and nobody's home. Well, they were there when you left the package? Yeah. A fat, bald-headed guy took it, as I remember. Well, check the neighbors. I already have, Mr. Jordan. Nobody knows for sure where they went. There's some talk about them leaving for Washington this morning, but I can't pin it down. They drove anyway. Car's gone. Garage is empty. Well, that's using your head, Malloy. At least we have something to shoot at. Do you remember the name? No, I don't. But that fat guy sure looked like a crook. Tabbed him for one the minute I laid What's out... What's that? Well, Miller came driving out and caught me and said you were hunting a package of stolen goods in the mail. Maybe he shot off his mouth too much, huh? Wasn't I supposed to know? Uh, no, no, Malloy, it's all right. I forgot that he knew what we were after. Well, you say you got everything else, huh? Yeah. Uh, be right in if you say so. You do that. Check. Foxy. Yeah? Look up 1724 Lime Street and get the name. Anything else? Get that name, then get on to it. The state police to intercept them if possible. Those people received a package this morning, and they may have left town for Washington. They're probably driving. With luck, they may not have opened that parcel yet. That's a real long shot, sir. Going on a trip, carrying an unopened package? Uh -uh, I doubt it. It's against common sense, but we have to try. You try, Foxy. Twelve o'clock, lunchtime. I ordinarily eat at Bailey's, but not today. We had sandwiches and coffee brought in. The coffee was welcome, but we didn't seem to be very hungry. Alone in my office sipping coffee, all I could think about was the time was half gone. This is Jordan. Darling, haven't you forgotten something? Uh, oh, hello, dear. Forgotten something? I'm down at Bailey's waiting for you. I've been here 25 minutes. We're lunching together today, remember? Oh, yes, well... Look, Alice, I'm afraid I'm going to have to stand you up. Something's come up. Well, you'll be sorry. There's the best-looking man sitting in here all by himself, the tall, rugged, iron-gray type. You know how I go for those. He'd probably be very glad to buy me a meal. <laughs> you try him and see. I have confidence in you, sweetheart. Anything to save us a buck. Then you definitely aren't coming. I'm afraid not. I'll tell you all about it tonight. <sighs> Sometime remind me never to marry a busy executive again. Bye. Bye. What do you got, Foxy? Things in my mind, Doug. First, let me get this one off. The cops picked up the Morgans. The Morgans? Yeah, the couple who were driving to Washington found them in a service station on the edge of town. They got the package? Well, they'd already opened it. Nothing much in it except some fancy sports shirts from Morgan himself. Then they're on their way again? Yeah, with apologies. I understand they were scared silly, though. Morgan offered to show the cop the shirts. He even wanted to give him one. Afraid they were stolen goods. <laughs> I'm glad that's cleaned up. Yeah, I say, just had a call from the Woodmont branch. Go on. Say, you remember Spicer? Spicer? Yeah, suspicion of robbing the mails. What about him? Looks as though he hung one on himself this time. Well, how's that? Well, as I say, this clerk out at Woodmont put a bunch of packages in the bins just before he quit last night. He remembered one for Dr. Turner. This Turner, it seems, collects magazine first editions. Sometimes these aren't worth insuring, sometimes they are. But they're always worth something more than their original price. And this package looked like one of those. What about the carrier, Spicer? Well, it seems he blew in just as the place was about to close. Said he forgot a bag of his with some new shoes that he bought. He drifted through and then right out again. Nobody paid any attention at the time. And this morning, Turner's package is gone, is that it? Mm -hmm. Where's Spicer? It's day off. Substitute's working. They're sure the package is gone. Well, Turner called to ask if it came in and they couldn't trace it. That's how they were sure it's missing. Well, I don't have to tell you the next move, do I? No, I already tried. Called his rooming house. He's not in. Didn't come in last night either. Do I call the police? I'd better do that, Foxy. Thanks. Uh, even if he has the thing, he surely opened it by now. I think so myself, but we can't be sure. We can't take chances. I better call. Uh -huh. Operator? Get me the police station. Ed, any luck with this pile of stuff? Well, one that's uncertain. I'm trying to make up my mind. That's so? Let's see. Here. It's not very big. Wouldn't have to be. Addressed to Jack Gordon, 128 Andrews Street. Is that anybody important? Never heard the name. If you ask me, it's a kid. What makes you think so? Return address. 
Columbia Foods Incorporated. I... Oh, cereal coupons. Fluoroscope indicates a watch inside. Let's put a stethoscope on it. Okay. Get it? Yeah. Ticks, all right. My question. Is it a dollar watch or is it it? A watch, probably. Probably. Let's play it safe. That's what I thought. Uh, take it outside? Ordinarily, yes. But we couldn't detect anything that would trigger the thing, so we'll put it in the water bucket here. Did you put wetting agent in the water? Yeah. It'll soak through the wrapping quicker and then throw anything else inside that much faster. That does it. Inside takes a little longer. Reminds me of the time I put in as an inspector. I hear you were pretty good, Doug. Just lucky. Getting the walkers, lucky. Well, better have a look at your toy here. Easy. Easy. Up she comes. There. <sighs> Looks as though we were right the first time, Doug. Here, have a pocket watch. Genuine hoppy. <laughs> Keep it for a souvenir. <laughs> That's one kid we all watch. <laughs> Will the budget stand it? It'll strain it, but it won't break it. Hey, let's step out back. I need a cigarette. Good idea. Uh, you heard about this carrier, Spicer? Yeah, Foxy told me. Get him yet? The police haven't. Well, maybe the police haven't got him, but has it... The clock's hands were still going around. 1.30. Just about one hour to go, and still we hadn't found that bomb. We hadn't found it. We hadn't found the missing carrier. All we had found was a new headache every few minutes. This is Jordan. Uh, Mr. Jordan, this is Malloy again. The driver, you know. Oh, yes, Malloy. Do you have something new? Well, sort of. You see, Mr. Jordan, it's like this. While I was eating lunch, I kept thinking... And all of a sudden, I remember this other package I delivered this morning, out on Beach Avenue. So I drive over here to see about it. I'm at the house now. Have you got the package? H have they opened it? No, it ain't open. But, well, you, uh, you better talk to this lady, Mr. Jordan. She won't listen to me. Here, Mrs. Bates, this is the postmaster on the line, himself in person. Hello. Uh, this driver says you're the postmaster, is that right? That's right. This is Douglas Jordan. I don't understand all this about the package which came from my husband. First this man delivers it, now he wants it back. But he's perfectly right, Mrs. Bates. We'd very much like to have that parcel. I don't see why. It has my husband's name on it. It's the correct address. I'm afraid I can't give it back until my husband has a chance to examine it. Uh... What did our driver tell you, Mrs. Bates? He had some story about stolen goods, but that doesn't make sense. Anyone would know that my husband was. Someone, never... someone may have confused him with another Bates. Have you thought of that? No, I hadn't, but I'm still sure that my husband should pass judgment on this. If I were to take the responsibility and I were wrong... Let me take the responsibility, Mrs. Bates. He might not see it that way. He might say I let myself be talked into something. Mrs. Bates, believe me. I'm sure your husband would be the first to thank us if he only knew. On my word of honor, we must have that package. Well, it's your responsibility, understand. Here, young man. But I don't think my husband will thank you. He doesn't like anyone connected with the government. None of you. For that, I'm sorry, Mrs. Bates, but thank you for giving us that parcel. <laughs> But it wasn't what we were after. A box of advertising pencils, that was all. Then it was half an hour. I forced myself to stay in my office waiting for a call that they'd caught Spicer or that someone, somewhere, had turned up something. Oh, Ed, any luck? Not a bit. We've combed everything, not a thing. They haven't caught up with Spicer yet. Huh? 
I, I think that's a false lead anyway. If he has the thing, he's opened it by now. That leaves us nowhere. Yes, it does. Somebody's forgotten something. That, that must be it. Yeah, maybe. Could be all a hoax, you know. What's the matter? Don't you want it to be a hoax, all this effort and nothing to show for it, that it? Want to repeat the Walker business, catch a murderer through the mail? No, Ed, no. I just want to be sure. Oh, by the way, he's out, you know. Who? Steve Walker, the brother. He's out of jail, didn't you know? Well, why are you looking so funny? Steve Walker. He said he'd get me. Well, yeah, so what? Where did I put it? Where's that lawn sprinkler? Lawn sprinkler? Now I know. Where'd that package come from? I've had it right here all day. Didn't even think about it. Came early this morning. Let's not think. Let's move. Give me that. Is there time? I think so. Better be. Get it under the fluoroscope. Look. That's it. Brother, that's it, all right. Do you have time to take it out to a safe place? No, sir. All we can do is put it in a water bucket, take it into the alley, and pray. Okay. Here goes. Water, get through that wrapper. Doug, we'll, we'll give it an hour, just in case. <laughs> Five minutes. Fifteen. Thirty minutes. Forty-five. One hour. And then... Well, Doug, there it is. All in little pieces. Be glad those pieces aren't you. I am, Ed. I am. A pretty good Hello. collection of evidence. Yeah, just you can go after Steve Walker with this, Doug. Mr. Jordan, telephone. Coming. On four. This is Jordan. Well, I couldn't bear the thought of you plodding away down there. Now, maybe you'd like to hear the story about my lunch, and it was the most exciting... Why, well, it'd better be good, honey. Wait till you hear the one I've got for you. Suspense, in which Mr. Victor Perrin starred in tonight's presentation of Fragile, Contents Death. Be sure to listen next week when we again bring you another presentation of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed in Hollywood by Anthony Ellis. Tonight's story was written by John F. Suter. The music was composed by Renee Garagank and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Featured in the cast were Vivi Janis, Leonard Weinrib, Helen Klebe, Herbert Ellis, Ted Bliss, John Larch, Charles Seal, and Frank Gerstle. This Friday night, the CBS Radio Workshop takes you on an exciting excursion into the world of fantasy as it recounts Antoine de saint Zupery's delightful story of The Little Prince. A bestseller in America, as well as France, and a joy to readers of all ages, The Little Prince is sure to be one of your all-time dramatic favorites as you hear it this Friday night over most of these same stations on the CBS Radio Workshop. Stay tuned for five minutes of CBS News to be followed on most of these same stations by My Son Jeep. You hear America's favorite shows on the CBS Radio Network.
Welcome back. Well, a really intriguing episode. It's a great premise, a great mystery with a ticking time bomb and a really ironic conclusion. I did actually notice the package being delivered to the postmaster at the beginning on this second lesson through the episode, but I think that may just have been because I knew how it ended. I came across this episode a few months back and really enjoyed it and decided that I would love to play it for this particular special. This is actually the second time that Suspense performed this script. The first was in 1951 with Paul Douglas playing the lead role. But it was this version that I heard. Plus, I do think that this era of radio is interesting to listen to because you have actors who have mostly been cast in supporting roles getting to actually play a more significant part and really show uh, their talent. And... I think Victor Perrin does a really good job here. This is, of course, a story that is kind of well-suited to an actor who's not like some big star, as he's playing a very grounded character. And this is just a, such an interesting story with all of the details that they managed to work in and how they managed to build suspense throughout. So I really enjoyed it. I hope you liked it as well. Now it's time for me to go ahead and thank our Patreon supporter of the day. And thank you so much to Philip. Philip supporting the program at the detective sergeant level of $7.14 per month. Uh, has been a Patreon supporter since December 2019. Thank you so much for your support, Philip. And that will do it for today. If you are enjoying this podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. And be sure to rate and review the podcast wherever you download it from. We'll be back tomorrow to start our regular Great Detectives lineup with Sam Spade, where... I have another pint of beer, bartender. Yeah, let me buy it. Sir, you can buy me drinks all night. But don't make the mistake of trying to get me drunk. Uh, make it two, will you, Eddie? Right, Sam. Sam, that means he knows you. You're okay by the house. Well, then you're okay by Captain Nostra. Here you are, two beers. Yeah. What's the rest of it, Sam? Spade. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you something about you, Sam Spade. You didn't come here to drink with me. You came to talk. Now, should we go over in a booth? That's a good idea. Right. Yeah. Now I'm ready to listen. Do you know Kelly Green? Kelly? The dancer? Yeah. Why, every blasted sailor in the Orient knows Kelly. Uh, let me see now. The last time I remember her, she was dancing on a table in Singapore for some Dutch officer. Well, she's in town right now. She said she has some information you'd want to buy. I'll bet she has. You a friend of hers? Since this morning. Oh, that's long enough for me. Now, what are you? Private detective? I am, and that brings up one other point. She said uh, you would pay me for finding her. Oh, surely. Uh, what's your fee? Uh, 25 will do. Year? Year is 50. No, no, no. Look, oh, would... take it. Now, as far as I'm concerned, you've earned it. Now, then, what's her address? Embassy Hotel, room 627. Uh, well, I'll get in touch with her. Well, see you around. Hey, wait a minute, Spade. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, how would you like to find someone for me? Why not? I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.